You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia, supported by Science in Sport. Today we are in Foligno. Dove siamo, Lionel? We're in Foligno in Umbria. Uh, edging our way up the middle of Italy and we're in some kind of sports complex this evening we're standing in the bar not that there are any drinks available here unfortunately well there are actually are there? we overdid it a bit last night didn't we? well we had a very nice meal didn't we we had an amazing meal um, worth giving a plug actually uh, to Trattoria Don Ciccio in Sulmona in Sulmona fantastic meal Uh, the chef was a real cycling fan as well had a picture up on the wall um, of Gino Bartoli and a, a, an old bike as well pinned to the wall and he was very friendly at the end of the meal gave us a free bottle of wine as well to take away with us he did indeed yeah where is that by the way it's in the boot oh, Lionel very okay. close to my bag okay good so anyway Lionel the first thing well no actually let's do your round up of the stage first I want to I want to I want to listen to this myself and see if you've see if you've caught everything Oh, blimey, Rich. That's, we're not, we're not going to catch everything in the opening part of the show, are we? Because we're going to talk in more depth about uh, what was quite an interesting stage in the end. It was stage seven of the Giro, 211 kilometres from Sulmona to Foligno. Lotto Sudal made it three in a row with Andre Greipel taking his second stage win of the Giro. That's either side of Tim Wellen's stage win yesterday. Uh, this time he beat Giacomo Nizzolo, Sasha Modolo and Caleb Ewan to the line. Marcel Kittel, who had been dropped at one stage and got back up to the bunch just in time to puncture with around five and a half, six kilometres to go. That ended his chances and it also cost him the red jersey, which he has lost to Andre Greipel. In the latest instalment of Every Second Counts, Richard, your unofficial franchise at the Giro, um, there was a nine-second split after the first 44 riders, and the most significant rider caught the wrong side of that split was Esteban Chavez of Orica, so he slipped down to 11th overall. We will go into detail about the stage. A man of the day was arguably Stefan Kuhn of BMC, the young Swiss rider riding his first Grand Tour. But the jerseys this evening, Tom de Moulin still 26 seconds ahead of Jakob Fuslang, Andre Greipel now in the red points jersey Tim Wellens has pipped Damiano Cunigo to the blue mountains jersey after all that effort that Vini Fantini went to which we will come on to in the all the polemics from today's stage and Bob Jungles of Etix Quickstep still has the white jersey well, I'm glad you noticed that Chavez lost nine seconds line I was wondering if you'd have if you'd studied your, your results sheet, that's very impressive. Well, all that effort yesterday to gain a few seconds in the last 500 mm-hmm. metres and then loses more than that today. That's how the, the Grand Tours go. Through inattention. Well, listen, we're going to talk uh, about the stage. Well done, by the way, also for mentioning that Tom Dumoulin's in the pink jersey. We got, <laughs> we got reprimanded last night by our colleague, Daniel Freib, um, who's keeping a very close beady eye on things at home. A beady ear. As well things, as... Yeah. Uh, 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 submitting his daily shark's tail which is coming out it's getting really steamy I think he's landed us in it a wee bit because he wants us also to talk to analyse more what's being said in the shark's tail but he's saved the raunchiest stuff for this week which is like (laughs) red faced podcasting Uh, he'll come back next week and it'll all be about the race won't it yeah I imagine so yeah get on to that shark's tail just gets more and more gripping as the Giro goes on Um, don't know what it says about Nibali and where his attention is but we'll get on to that and we're going to do something a little bit different tonight I think we're going to talk about the stage in the second part aren't we? and we got a wee bit from Tom Dumoulin in his press conference in terms of some of the things he said which is interesting as always but in the first part we're going to do something a little bit different aren't we Lionel because you spoke this morning to Max Chiandri the sports director at BMC yeah I did and the reason I went to talk to Max was because BMC one of the biggest budget teams in the world with a budget right up there amongst the likes of Sky and Astana and Katusha are here without a a rider for the overall classification and so they have a certain sense they have freedom to try and win some stages but also that brings with it a bit of pressure they've also got a lot of young riders so this is a bit of a baptism of fire for them I wanted to go and ask Max how that changes um, the mentality for the, for the sports directors because they're in a way guiding these riders through and so I spoke to Max and then the events of today's stage really threw all of those comments into quite a sharp focus because BMC were at the centre of things. Stefan Kuhn, one of their young riders, um, 22 years old, Swiss rider, 
really animated the day. He had to work very hard to get into the move and there was all sorts of things going on out on the road in the early part of the stage that perhaps wouldn't have garnered a huge amount of attention. But then because of how the stage played out and particularly because of a comment that Tom Dumoulin made after the stage, which we'll come on to, it kind of throws a spotlight on how Grand Tours are races within a race. There's so much going on um, that you have different riders going for different objectives. Anyway, I spoke to Max this morning just to get a handle on how they were approaching this Giro. What kind of effect does it have on your job when you come to a Grand Tour without somebody who can contend overall and you have to try and get something else out of the race? That was a little bit uh, what I started off the meeting with uh, the first day after the prologue. And right away I said, this is your Giro in terms of it's your opportunity, guys. We have guys what are really used to work with the leaders in classics and in stage races, you know. And this time a lot of these uh, these guys like Pinciato and Os and uh, De Marchi and Darwin, all guys, what they, had their, they have their own chance, you know. So for me it's like easy and hard I'd say sometimes easy to kind of find a motivation sometimes a little bit harder to push them in in areas where they feel like a little bit threatened by you know the stage how hard it is you know look at the stage like yesterday the mic was like kind of pissed off you know that was a lost opportunity at the end of the day you know it is it is a ta- it is a challenge because at the end of the day if, you know if, if you look at the the overall wins of all of my guys <laughs> They're not too high, you know. Guys, what won one or two races in uh, in their whole career, and or one race a year. I pull out uh, of all of this uh, valuation. I pull out Stefan that he is actually, I think, a leader. You know, he is growing into a leader. He is growing into a stronger, strong rider. Uh, fortunately, lucky on Friday with the prologue. So far, Daniel Oss has been in a breakaway. Have you targeted particular days for particular riders, or do the riders themselves say? put their hands up and say today I, I fancy trying no well I did an overview of the state of the race I did I, I looked at the whole race put it in in simple colors in terms of you know high mountain med- medium mountain flat days time trials and then pinpointed guys to stages but that doesn't mean if somebody puts a hand up today and say I want to do the race why not you know I'm up for that but more or less I like to give days where we're on and off you know in terms of trying also to, to have some of these guys learn a little bit the younger ones like you know really on okay we go for it off we we say we're in the gruppetto we we sit on the back no problem at all that's how i kind of divided it up a little bit so you don't want to flog a young guy who might be doing his first or second grand tour by getting him to work every day or try something every day for sure i mean i have a guy like sydney first grand tour ever yesterday he's doing mistakes every day you know yesterday i asked a 4k to go on the first climb i was like guys you want jacket it's not raining we had a guy on the top but the, the, the rain came in literally a K before the top and it was late. I'm car 18 to get a jacket. The guy calls me like 2K in the descent. I want a jacket. I'm like, no. And then I see him in the middle of the road a K after sh- shivering. And, you know, at the bottom of the descent, he was at three minutes. You know, that, that, they're mistakes you pay, you know. So some of these guys, you have to, this is the way I'm, I'm working with. You know, I'm trying targeting a, a result and, I'm, and then I've got a guy what's, on the learning <laughs> mode big time people don't really appreciate that perhaps that you know a simple mistake like that it can be really costly for a, for a rider and it, it could it could have sort of longer term kind of repercussions could get sick as a result of that for example so i guess the riders have to learn from their own mistakes too yeah i got four kids and i tell them once or twice i don't tell them three times you know so he's saying he's a guy what he's putting in a mistake a day you know <laughs> I'm like, Manuel, it's, it's a long Giro. We just started, you know, and every detail counts. You know, a detail, as you say, is a long repercussion. You know, that simple thing and, you know, that was a three. He, he got that. Uh, I said, if the valley was going to be full gas, you're there with four or five guys and you had to do the whole race by yourself. And that was an enormous, uh, uh, enormous amount of energy just to get to the finish, you know. So if you put it on the, on the balance, I would have I would have shivered another few more k because I picked you up like two k down the descent. So you had another four k to do, and then the rain was kind of peeling off a bit. So yeah, it goes into details. It goes into motivation. It's uh, Giro is not you know watching your TV. There's a lot of stuff involved in in getting these guys up there and and getting them on the front, you know and. In terms of like getting into the breaks, we often see the same teams make the early break. Vinnie Fantini or Willia Tristina here. Is there any value for BMC to put the younger guys in those sorts of moves? Or do you have to 
Yeah, because that doesn't necessarily, you know, coach them for making Im- an impact in a world tour race, does it? No, I'm totally against these these teams that do these type of moves. I always look at a bigger picture. I look at who we are, what our goals are, what our values are. You know, what I what I want to teach my riders, what I what I want to achieve. The break where Joey Roscoff was in uh, when we arrived at what is it, Praia Mare, and Vini Fantini just ended up pulling the whole. You know, I thought it was just like you miss the break. The break goes, and then, I mean, they had two good days in Holland. They had a guy out there. The actual break let that guy do one lap when uh, uh, the second stage in Holland. So they had their fair amount. I mean, I wouldn't push it too much. There's a way of conduct you should have with respect to other teams and respect for yourself. You know what some other t- some teams, I think. Just so you mean they chased down a, a promising-looking move because they'd missed it? Yeah, exactly, just for that. And, you know, these teams get invited, these teams, they do get a chance, and it's a good chance for them, but I think they should still respect teams that spend 20, 25 million euro, and these teams get along with a million probably, and I really one of the guys who used to be a plumber <laughs> a year or two ago, so... You know, I think against that, I mean, it's, it's good that everybody gets a chance, but there should be a way of doing things, you know, with a respect. But I guess, every, you know, without those teams going on the attack, the, the, the Giro would just ride along with nothing happening until the finale, I guess. Yeah, sometimes some stages are like that, but the stage, uh, you know, the importance of a stage like Praia Mario is 230k. I mean, for somebody watching a TV, yeah, it's a boring day, but for somebody else, it was a pretty hard stage, you know, so... Uh, it's 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 part of the whole the whole Giro. I mean, yeah, they can just ride along and then they could have a great firing finale. You know, I mean, still the GC contenders kind of you know we see them in the in the in the, in the tour, we see them in the Vuelta. You know, this is how the the, the, the system is is put together. There is some teams, what smaller teams, what have a chance. And these, you know, they, we know that these teams are the ones going to make the first attack. They're going to they're gonna chase down and stuff like that. So. I know Tim Wellens is maybe a level above most of your riders, um, perhaps, at the moment. But when you saw how they pulled off that move in, in the final 70k... It was great. I mean, it was fantastic. They were cold like our guys, and that's what we said yesterday. We said they were cold, and they just didn't have... Uh, they, didn't, uh, they didn't waste time in, uh, in putting jackets on. They just took an opportunity, what we lost. Some interesting stuff there from Max Chiandri, but what leapt out to you, Richard? Well, first of all, was that Max Chiandri or was it Daniel Freib? Because <laughs> Daniel Freib does the best Max Chiandri impersonation ever. He did a whole Q&A as Max Chiandri, didn't he, at a, at a dinner that he, we were at? He, he did indeed. It was quite extraordinary, really, <laughs> very, wasn't it? Very good. We'll go and do that next week. Um, very interesting. He is always very open, isn't he, Max? And, and maybe too open at times. I mean, I don't know how young Manuel... Senni, the young Italian rider, will feel uh, having been uh, exposed for his error, I suppose, in yesterday's stage. And, and compared to one of Max's four children, in a, in a way, <laughs> as well. I mean, yeah, I mean, a, a harsh lesson, but you know, and it's, it's not often you get that sort of insight into mm. you know, actual management issues with individual riders from a, a sports director. And you know, um, I'm sure Senni was was left in no uncertain terms that he'd made an error uh, and one that could cost him as you pointed out to Max I mean some of it, what he said is is you know it must be a, an odd situation for such a big team to be here as almost underdogs in a way it's a very strange situation for them and you know some of a little, little bit of sour grapes about the likes of the Vini Fantinis the whipping boys of this Giro for their approach to the racing which is just to shoot a man up the road without a thought whether the, the, the break will actually succeed and also their pursuit of King of the Mountains points of course with Damiano Cunego unfortunately BMC also have a bit of reputation for uh, you know, throwing their weight about a bit and, and being very dismissive of the smaller teams Jim Okovitz has certainly been in the past and I, I wasn't sure exactly what Max was what kind of racing he is looking for D- does he want those teams to just sit quietly in the peloton and and watch the big boys racing i'm not sure well exactly i mean if, if everyone did nothing we'd just have a promenade to the finish and uh, you know or we'd, we'd have very limited amounts of action i mean uh, vinnie fantini and the other teams are perfectly entitled to do whatever they wish in the bike race um but what was interesting and we'll we may come on to it a bit later, but Tom de Moulin making the comment about, you know, mm. if, if if Cunigo can't get in the break, he's going to give him he's a push. He's going to push him into yeah. it tomorrow. Yeah. It just shows you that while on the one hand, the small teams are entitled to do whatever they wish, 
they are still part of this moving community and, and it's very easy to kind of irritate and, and rile it also, their rivals. It also reminds me of some of the conversation with the Young Americans for our Friends special podcast with uh, Larry Warbass, who sadly uh, withdrew from the Giro today. He's had problems with his leg. Um, Joe Dombrowski and Ian Boswell as well, they were talking about the, the, in a Grand Tour especially, there's always a, a, a rider or riders and a team which all the other teams kind of get really irritated by. They're, they're just an, annoyances. They're like <laughs> flies on the windshield mm. almost. And, you know, in the big teams especially, you can imagine the, the conversation on the bus. And I was speaking to Dombrovsky the other day. We, we were standing at the start and we watched a rider um, from the Willier Tristina team come down a, a quite a steep uh, hill on his way back from signing on stage. And he was just going too fast after signing on. He recklessly careering down this hill with loads of people around and he crashed he hit a barrier and he fell off and oh, Dabrowski just sh- shook his head and said it's always the same guys <laughs> even <laughs> yeah. when the race isn't on well yeah I mean that, that that sort of goes down through history there's always been teams that have been found at the bottom of uh, the pile when uh, when the crashes happen but what I, what's jumped out from Max there also was um the value that a team of BMC stature can give their riders there's no point in sending them off up the road in a Vinny Fantini style attack which is doomed to failure they have to pick their moments a bit more cleverly otherwise they're not going to you know they're not going to get any chance to actually finish off Um, and so they have targeted specific days so if we talk about today in particular um, because it did turn out to be a really interesting stage as we were driving from the start to the finish we were hearing that the peloton had split into three and all the sprinters were driving on the early second category climb didn't quite know what the pressure at the front was on that maybe it was kicking off early for what reason we don't know well as it turned out at the finish we, we pieced it together and Stefan Kuhn of BMC was one of three riders the other two were Jay McCarthy of Tinkoff and Patrick Gretsch of AG2R and they were trying to get the early move going three of them they were on the climb and they had a nice advantage and it looked like that might start the move of the day then Vinny Fantini for Damiano Cunigo in the blue King of the Mountain jersey started chasing very hard. Whether it was to try and set Cunigo up to win the points at the top or whether it was because they'd missed the break again is a matter for debate. But either way, over the other side, uh, Vinny Fantini caught the leading trio. The irony is that not only did Cunigo not win the climb, but he got beaten by Tim Wellens at the top and lost the blue jersey. So, so in a way, it didn't work out either way. But embarrassing Kuhn then of BMC wasn't going to take that lying down he's had a pretty tough start to his first Grand Tour he fell off in the opening time trial uh, back in Appledore been very disappointed about that and um, he wasn't going to take it lying down he then attacked again got another small group going and then towards the end he took off on his own he's a very good time trialist he's a, a 2015 World Individual Pursuit Champion on the track and for a while it looked like he might Uh, make it Uh, he had a tailwind um, but the chase was on from the sprinters teams and obviously it all came back together Um, but I spoke to Stefan Kuhn afterwards about that perseverance and how he felt when he'd been brought back in at a a slightly unusual point in the race today you had to make two big moves to get your opportunity yeah I really had to force it and uh, until the end they didn't make it easy for us especially in the beginning I was with, with two other good guys nice break and we saw we had it but then uh, they got us back and then it's kind of hacking again and you still I already did 40k's in the front it wasn't easy but then I moved again and I was in the good move and even then five climbers and me so maybe it wasn't the the best group to be up the road with but I thought yeah I'll wait I'll wait and uh, I thought if I have two minutes over the top of the climb then I can make it, but I had only 50 seconds, and it, it, it wasn't it wasn't enough. In the end, I tried. If you never try, you're never gonna win, and you never know what happens. I mean, Kittle punctured with six k's to go. If, if something like that happens earlier, then you've already one team less, and, and so on and so on. So it felt quite good out there the whole day, and. Uh, yeah, it was a solid day in the saddle, I guess. <laughs> because it was Vinny Fantini who chased down the first move for Cunigo for the King of the Mountains points. Were you annoyed at that point, or were you hoping that they'd just let you go? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, in the end, everybody can take his chances in a race, so so can uh, so do they. But in the end, I mean, they chased the first move down. 
I don't know if he got any points, but at least we three guys went over the top in front. And then they went again on the, on the second climb, but they didn't make it. I mean, in the end, for sure, it's a race, but it doesn't make it easier for us. And uh, in the end, for sure, it, it didn't play <laughs> in my cards that, that they went after this, but everybody has chances and they took it. I don't want to go in the break when there is no chance of getting to the finish. And so I was kind of uh, <laughs> depressed today when we had only... We were always riding at 2 minutes 30 and so on. And and then I, I nearly said to the car, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stop because why should I stay out there? There's the time trial coming up on Sunday. But then, yeah, bike riders are hard men and <laughs> so am I, I guess. So. Have you been waiting to have an opportunity like this after your crash on the stage one time trial? Have you been willing yourself to get out there? Yeah, I was really disappointed after my crash on the time trial. For sure, you never know, but... I was feeling really good and uh, I was on a time check, I was on even time with Dumoulin and I saw it, maybe it was one of these days I, I really had it and then I crashed and all my hopes faded and it took me, I, I have to admit, it took me a few days to get over it. Eurosport, the home of cycling. So you heard there our Eurosport jingle, just uh, which just neatly followed the Stefan Kung interview because Kung was a very popular choice as Peddler de Charme for today, that's our daily competition at the Giro please send your nominations in hashtag PDC Giro we present a Peddler de Charme t-shirt every day to a rider I think the most popular photograph so far has been Daniel Oss who who, when asked to smile produced an expression that was I don't know what it was it was a grimace it's a very <laughs> odd but very very funny picture that um, and yeah our, our very popular nomination uh, today was Stefan Kung so he was presented with the Peddler de Charme t-shirt the coveted garment and he will uh, will post that picture in the morning when this episode goes out looks great on a bike doesn't he i mean you know he's clearly incredibly strong very aerodynamic you know he's got everything really to to win stages like this in the future guy by the sounds of things as yeah, well yeah very much yeah yeah let's hear again from max chandry shall we because you caught up with him at the finish as well i want to say vini fantini's fault but you know they kind of you know the break goes they survive a climb a lot of them you know i got a couple of guys what are not even climbers and after you know and then Fini Fantini is chasing it back for the KOM you couldn't have asked for more from Stefan though because he made the first move then got caught up by the race for the king of the mountains really and then made the second move he, he didn't give in Stefan from the crash on day one he's just he's just got so much anger and energy to, 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 to let go on, on during the Giro on the stages on the road and I think today he just kind of let it out a little bit. We're going to go full on in the in the TT. The day after tomorrow, he has a good chance. I saw the TT. It's near my house. We try. We try every day. It's not easy against the peloton. But the hope is the last thing what dies, you know. So we hoped a lot. I mean, we were kind of pushing him as much as we could from the car. So that was Max, really, uh, bookending the day. Uh, the hope is uh, the thing that always kills you fans of unsuccessful football teams will be familiar with that sentiment yep Max Chandri we'll catch up with him again during the Giro no doubt uh, and maybe they'll get that elusive stage when Rick Zabel uh, has been riding extremely well he's had two top ten finishes Eric Zabel's son um, I spoke to him yesterday actually and uh, he'll feature in our, an episode of Kilometre Zero next week uh, on Fathers and Sons uh, anyway well, uh, that's all to come. You release your comment to zero today, uh, Lionel, which was Martin Chilingi, mm. uh, yeah. feature on the sort of star of the Netherlands stages. Yeah, and I think um, Martin Chilingi, another very eloquent talker, interesting backstory, uh, lots to talk about. Um, and really, the reason he stood out was because he had this remarkable weekend back in the Netherlands in his hometown, Arnhem. Um, but but he also represents kind of. I said three quarters of the peloton, Rich, and you, you rightly said no, it's more than that. More, more, you know, the great majority of riders in the peloton, that is kind of what they can aspire to, uh, getting off the front, even if it's not a successful move. You know, they can, they can play a role in the race by just being aggressive and trying their luck. And it was, you know, it just shows you the day after he lost his blue jersey as king of the mountains, he was back 
dropping back to the Lotto Yumbo team car, stuffing all the bidons up his jersey and carrying the water bottles back to his teammates again, back on duty, if you like. And often when you see riders in brakes or riders being very aggra- aggressive in races, you, you, you don't give it too much thought. You think it's chance or luck or the, the guy's on a good day. Often, as in the case of Chilingi, it's been carefully thought out and planned and trained for, in his case, for months. And it's nice, I think, to celebrate you know what he achieved there because he couldn't he wasn't going to win any stages he wasn't going to take the Maglia Rosa but he did what he could and you know fair play to him now let's talk a little bit about the day Andre Greipel took Lotus Sudal's third stage win in a row uh, he won two days ago Tim Wellens of course won yesterday and Greipel won today Kittel Marcel Kittel had mechanical problems six kilometers to go so he was out of it uh, in his press conference Greipel was asked a couple of questions about the World Championships in October in Mm. in Qatar, of course. It's the Sprinters' World Championship. He's asked asked if he was inverting German sprinting and putting in a bid for, you know, the team leader status in that German team. Uh, His response to that was, the World Championships are in October. (laughs) Which Um, is is not only true, but also a very fair point. But he also did point out later that he he has proved that he's good on longer distances, Mm. uh, which might have been a veiled sort of remark that Kittel perhaps hasn't proved himself over those... uh, Heck of a team they've got, though, Rich, haven't they? I mean, they mm. could potentially have Andre Greipel, John Degenkolb, Marcel Kittel. I mean, that's... Tony Martin to drag... And Tony Martin to lead it all out. Amazing. Yeah, no, they've got (laughs) an amazing team. Um... There was an amusing moment where one Italian journalist began his question, Marcel, to which Greipel didn't look impressed at all and just said, <laughs> I am not Marcel. Um, oh. He was asked about Strava. I don't like to talk about numbers, he said. I speak with the legs. Mm. Tom de Moulin then came in as, you know, he seems to cope with these um, daily chores, which drag on, I think, longer at the Giro than at the Tour, um, with, with great humour and, and grace. The weather forecast for tomorrow isn't so good. There's some gravel roads tomorrow. He didn't know that. He said he's taking one day at a time, blah, 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 the Mm. usual. But he said bad weather wouldn't make much difference. We will look a bit dirtier, he said. Very Um, philosophical. Which is is true. I asked him, uh, I mean, I said last night that he seemed to be more equivocal about whether he's here to, you know, to, to, to battle for the overall. He... And he's been... His tone on that has been changing and it's hardening. And tonight he did say my shape turns out to be pretty good so maybe I will be riding for GC which you know, just confirms what we what we suspected if he's if he's in as good form as he seems to be and others aren't you know Nibali and the, the guys who we thought would be the big favourites Mikel Landa apparently is under the weather a little bit you know and Alejandro Valverde didn't perform as well as we expected in the first summit finish. you know De Moulin is a guy in form no question in form counts for an awful lot not You'll not only that rich but I mean, the point you made about the, the the all the protocol that the leader has to go through after the stage so he has to go to the podium be presented with his jersey then he has to go to anti-doping control then he has to come into the press conference he has to be interviewed on tv in between all of that as well he's got quite a lot of practice of that because he did it all at the well to last year so you know being in the pink jersey and having it is only adding to his experience as he as he goes on and remember he's still only 25 so it's not like this is you know it's not like we should be worrying that he's kind of taking on too much but it is interesting that in the last two days he the narrative has changed a little bit and he's being a bit more strident about what he wants from the race yeah he is um you you remember last night i said about Tim Wellens had had said that it, during the stage yesterday de Mula, who's on a rival team of course had come up to him and said now would be a good time to attack and I asked de Mula about that in the press conference I asked whether that was an act of friendship because they are good friends or whether there was more to it whether it was more strategic and he said it was just an act of friendship he said I knew that Tim Wellens had lost a lot of minutes overall and he said to him if you attack now we won't close it maybe another team will but this could be your moment he said he's a really nice guy I like him as a person if I see an opportunity for him I'll give him a tip however Wellens told a, a Dutch colleague of ours this morning that if you know that the, the favour will be returned at some point by his team I think his team Lotto Sudal who are who also don't have an overall contender here recognise that De Moulin played a part in Wellens stage win you know the, 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 the team in pink and defending overall lead is you know has a lot of influence and a lot of sway that's a hugely underestimated part of the Grand Tours isn't it I mean mm. these kind of 
you know, deals. And, isn't yeah, it? but these kind of deals and alliances that are formed, not necessarily over the course of one race, but over the course of a season, or sometimes going back, you know, teams have good relationships because the sports directors get on. Uh, but it's really rare to actually see it in the public domain and actually it's, have it's it kind of it acknowledged. Out. Yeah, I mean, De Moulin, you know, we talk about the patron, and there's been guys like Fabian Cancellara who apparently was pushing his weight around a bit yesterday. In the, in the past, Eno, Lance Armstrong, they've been more sort of malevolent patrons ruled by fear. Someone like Miguel Indurain was a patron who, was a very, who, would, who would rule in the same way as De Moulin, by giving favours to people and, and, and being someone who everybody liked. And I think De Moulin is in that mould, far more interesting uh, personality and, and more charismatic than Indurain. But he could be that kind of that kind of leader uh, if that's what he turns out to be he was asked about that whether because the thing that let him down at the Vuelta of course the thing that probably lost him the Vuelta was his team uh, he did not have a strong team he's got a bit of a stronger team here but not hugely strong for the mountains in the third week lots of Sudal also perhaps don't have the strongest team for that sort of train but nevertheless they could be of huge assistance and he dismissed that he said they won't ride they won't help me in the third week because they think I'm a nice guy Mm-hmm. Nevertheless, um, having a team, a strong team like that, in your corner, might not do him any harm at all. Especially on the kind of the more hidden elements of stages, you know, early on, first climbs, that kind of thing. You know, it doesn't necessarily help or teammate support doesn't necessarily mean having a guy with you on the last climb. I mean, we've seen the pattern in the Giro over a number of years. There's really, in this race, three teams that you know will be sort of mob-handed. Astana, Sky, Movistar. Everyone else, it will be ones, possibly two riders. Hang on, Lionel, what's that noise? What's that? Ooh, we're going to need a bigger boat. Get out of the water. <laughs> Passamo a Roma e quasi non me ne accorsi. Stavo già immaginando la nostra prima serata romantica. All'altezza di Napoli, nella mia testa c'era spazio solo per l'immagine dei nostri corpi avvinti dalla passione. We passed Rome and I almost didn't realize. I was already imagining our first romantic evening. Around about Naples, in my head there was space only for the image of our bodies in the grip of passion. Fifty Shades of the Shark there, Lionel, I think. I know, I know. It's a, it's an amazing image of uh, Vincenzo Nibali and his Astana teammate Valerio Agnoli spooning in the team hotel, possibly. Oh. I don't know. <laughs> Unconfirmed rumours. Um, these, are, these are just... This is just speculation. This is just what goes on in Lionel's head. <laughs> and, uh, but no, mm. very... I mean, Daniel has dropped us in it. Um, he wants us to really analyse the these installments which are getting steamier and steamier um, he, he thinks there's a deeper meaning here that, that Nibali's mind is perhaps not always on the job as it were oh, oh it is and that's the problem <laughs> I mean we're straying so close to the line I mean, here we job, his job is cycling <laughs> oh <one>. yeah sorry <laughs> sorry <laughs> again your mind I don't like to I know we maybe we need the that. maybe we need the Benny Hill theme in here although that would be the perfect entrance music for Chiro wouldn't it in a way the way he runs into <laughs> the runs into the shot it would I think Chiro is actually going to be joining us in a moment or two we're just <laughs> waiting for his his form to appear around that 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 corner there it's it's really let's take a little pause while we wait for him you are listening to the cycling podcast at the Giro d'Italia supported by science in sport science in sport fueled by science thank you very much to science in sport we sent out a little tweet today thanking our sponsors uh, without whom we wouldn't be here covering the Giro uh, producing a nightly episode and three com to zero episodes a week thank you very much science and sport also to Eurosport who I mentioned earlier and Maserati for lending us a car and we're extremely grateful to you all and also to our listeners who have propelled us to fourth in the iTunes charts today which is a nice pine three football podcast exactly where we want to be at the end of the first week isn't it Rich perfectly placed poised to move up the charts this week. now look who's here Chiro Chiro thanks listeners happy to be back Chiro, we had our latest installment of the Shark's Tale tonight from Daniel, the latest little um, moment in Vincenzo Nibali's autobiography. How is Vincenzo? Well, uh, certainly uh, after the stage of uh, Roccarasso, he was uh, a little bit upset with his car for the tactical mistake that they committed in the last climb. And it was clear, I mean, he said really clear that he was upset and also the car in the person of Beppe Martinelli said that 
it has been a mistake of the car. A mistake of the car? A mistake, oh. a mistake oh, made Martinelli. by the car, right, exactly, okay. exactly. And so, um, certainly now they, they have to find again their union between them. This will be important for the future of this Giro. This happens a lot, doesn't it, with Nibali? There's always a bit of polemic, a bit of uh, friction, a bit of tension. Well, certainly, I mean, it was a clear, uh, clear polemic uh, after his uh, expulsion from Welt last year. It's uh, interesting to, to note that uh, in this case, Vincenzo has really a kind sense inside him of the hierarchy. I mean, he's very respectful uh, of the hierarchy in the team. So normally, if uh, uh, certainly they talk about tactics, he gives uh, his way of thinking about tactics, but if he receives an order from the car, normally he tries to do what the, the sport director says to him. Okay. Now, Chiro, when I bumped into you earlier today, you were very excited. Or in fact, it was yesterday, wasn't it? You were very excited because you had some, some nugget for our listeners, something to share about uh, Filippo Pozzato. Yes. Is this the moment? Is this the moment? Well, maybe it's not the moment because I know that Daniel Freebie is very jealous. I mean, he wrote me a really personal text message and he said, no, you can't talk about people Pozzato when I'm not here. So we save this for next week when Daniel's back. No, 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 no. I want to, I want to say now because I think that this is the moment, Daniel. Sorry, but you are not here, and uh, and uh, okay, I okay. There is nothing to do, but we are here. And listen, I remember that many of you were really happy when I defined Ivan Basso as my lighthouse, lighthouse during the last Tour de France. But Filippo Pozzato, as you can easily imagine, is more than a lighthouse for me. Yes, listeners, in this world of cycling. Pippo Pozzato is my very soul sister. Huh? What do you think about this? Write me on Twitter or give your impression because for me it's really important. Filippo Pozzato is your soul sister. Soul sister listeners. I mean, soul sisterness, yes. Okay, I think, I think in English we'd say soul mate, wouldn't we? But, you know, soul mate. I mean, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, the kind of the translation. But, but in Italian like, it must be yeah, soul sister, yeah? Exactly. I mean, in Italian maybe uh, it's a kind of anima gemella. Uh, certainly I never... W- I never got married with Filippo Pozzato, eh, listeners? Well, don't don't rule it out. I mean, (laughs) I mean, I would know. I can do this, but but in this sense, yeah, soulmate or soul sister. Thanks, Pippo. Thank you, Giro. Thank you, Giro. Beautiful. Pippo Pozzato, not seen much of him so far in this Giro. When are we going to see tomorrow? Perhaps could be a stage for him tomorrow. Not really. No, normally the stage of Filippo is always the next one. <laughs> and so, no, I, I'm joking for sure. I mean, uh, uh, normally he could try to enter in a breakaway in the second uh, in the second week. I mean, it's the only possibility for him. Well, if I should if I should bet, in my opinion. Pippo is not going to win a stage in this Giro. This is my bet, listeners. But I hope that I'm doing a mistake. <laughs> Pippo, show me that I'm wrong. Prove your soul sister wrong. <laughs> Thank this you, Giro. Awesome. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. Listen, we better wrap it up. We there, had, I yeah. Think, uh, Lionel. Mm. Uh, so thank you again, Giro, and thank you very much, Lionel. Thank you, Richard. See you on the dirt roads uh, tomorrow afternoon. Yeah.